All right. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me in the background? Please do this. Don't leave me all alone here. I'm already stressed uh, enough out of my way. Un peu plus haut? Un peu plus haut, toujours un peu plus loin? All right. Okay. Who, he con who here consider themselves to do DevOps every day? All right. Who here has a team that does application, the other is sysadmin? To the, okay, who here has a team responsible for their application, their business value, and another one, uh, another team of sysadmins that maintain servers and all? Well, wow. and here is it because you don't work in informatic or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Who here believe they won't learn anything out of this talk? And by the way, this talk is a beginner talk. Oh, wow, nobody. Oh, OK, cool. So the only one who thinks he knows everything. Good. <laughs> OK. Um, who here only talks English? Who here talks French and only French? All right, so I'll do the talk in English. Uh, I'm open to French question and English question. Both doesn't matter to me. All right. So for tonight, the second presentation, or as my old manager used to say, the low-level shit presentation. Who am I? I'm oops, sorry. Who am I? I'm Eric Lafontaine. I've worked for seven years at Bell Mobility as a uh, network operator, and uh, since the last two months, I'm now at Ubisoft doing exactly the same thing, but as an online programmer. So. The agenda, f the agenda for today will be just to present some concepts so that we are all aligned on what's going on, what I'm going to be presenting, the concept you need to know uh, before going into the demonstration that I'm going to do. And then by the end of the talk, I'm going to present some tips and tricks I've learned uh, in my journey in an as a network operator. And I'm hoping those tips and tricks will be something that will be useful in your everyday life at some point. All right. So let's start basic. What's a file? Who here can at least tell me what a file, the concept of a file should be? Uh, what? An uh, int. A file would be an int. Ah, file descriptors. He's not bad. He knows this stuff. So the file concept is pretty basic. Actually, it's an abstract concept. Uh, it's just a bucket of bytes. You can read from it, or you can write to it. That's basically what it, the concept of the file wants to be. Sorry? Uh, what, mean, what does it mean, bucket? Will it be just sequence? It's a good question, but maybe we can have the question. Yes. Yeah. So it's a bucket. It doesn't have to be in sequence. It doesn't. The implementation behind it is up to interpretation. Do we deal with files every day? Or do we, de do we deal with another kind of object? Someone already mentioned it. Exactly. We try not to deal with the implementation of a file because otherwise we have to know the order of the bytes we put them in. Is it the big endianness or the low endianness? Or is it uh, in this block of byte or is it in this other block of byte that I'm supposed to be writing to? It's super complicated, so we try to abstract the file to something else. And that's why we have file handlers. File handlers are going to be given to us by, uh, sorry. The file handler is a, an implementation in the program. It's given to the program through a, uh, no OS system calls. When you do the open, it goes and do the system call open and it returns to you a file handler. And that's what with, with what you're dealing for writing or reading from a file. This file handler is a, an actual pointer to a file descriptor in the uh, OS. And uh, the file handler is used to abstract the flow of how to store data. Do you store it on an extension four system or an uh, extension tree or I forget the other one, ZFS or XFS? So in summary, how computers work nowadays when you do a FGET C, sorry, I've stole this, really no shame. I stole this from a presentation because I loved it. And basically, when we deal, oh, come on, where is it? Oh. OK, there. When we're normally writing our programs, we're staying at this layer here. We manipulate strings of data, which is the equivalent of streams, because a string is actually a, 
sequence of bytes. And then when we want to write to a file, we use to we call the handles, which will go and call the right system calls, the right registers in the CPU as well, which will go then call the right file descriptors who knows how the file is stored, which will call the right commands and data to send them to the right media. So this is how today computer works. Now, who did I lust with this? Wow. No, I'm, I'm really surprised. Sorry. Uh, yes? What's fgetc? Fgetc, I believe, is a command in C. Like a, you could, well, actually, just maybe you can help me with this. Nope. OK. It's to get carried uh, on the stream level. On the stream level? Yeah, you, you, you pass it a file handler and you say, I want to get the next character, right? OK, so fgetc is a function where you pass in the file handler. I just forgot about it for this audience because I got a blank sheet in front of me now. Oh, sorry. So this is how the file handler would normally be at the low level IO. Uh, the file concept would be hidden somewhere between the system calls and the actual media. But what about sockets? Sockets is kind of a special type of file. It's not something that we store the bytes on a driver. It's a different kind of media. Oh, shit. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. Sorry. So if we had to describe what a socket, if we had to describe what a socket would be, it would be the representation of a remote file. So if we go and read on Wikipedia, what they actually say is uh, a socket is a local endpoint representing a com network communication path, which is really too complex to say just that it's a remote file that is local. What? <laughs> yeah, it's really different. Uh, so again, thanks for Sada Kazri for this small summary. And so if we now look at this, where would the socket be? Well, a socket would be something we call as a syscall to tell the OS where, what path we want to take so that it can open the right file for us. Then it would be asking that same file handler to handle for us the read and the write. So it would be a file descriptor as well. And it would write to the network cards, which has the commands and data transfer to send down the wire. Does that seem any different from what a file would do? Yes, no? All right. <laughs> so what would? Uh, yeah, but in the, so yes, a socket is an abstraction, every abstraction is leaky. Uh, for now, we're going to consider that you can, it's going to be a real abstraction, but it's never going to be. So now I'm leaving the concept domain to go on to the CLI. Please wish me luck. Oh, and who here knows if it's my first presentation or not? Because it is. All right. So I'm going to present what we are going to be running tonight. So we're going to have this small monitoring script that we'll be running in the blue screen. This blue screen will do a clear a sleep, just so that we get a French prompt all the time. Run a, gonna run an, it's going to run a netstat on the port 15,000, so that we can see all the connection being made to that port. And then for all the Python script that I'm going to start, we're going to go at and look at all the file descriptors. By the way, is that, any, is that something new for some people here, the fact that you can see the file descriptor inside a process? All right, so some people learned. All right, my goal is already done. Oh, yeah, sorry, my bad. What we are going to be running tonight is this server file and this client file. Uh, we're going to go through them, don't worry. Uh, yeah. 
we're going to go here. How I'm going to do this presentation is I'm going to run both scripts into a Python debugger. That way, we can analyze on each step that I'm actually executing what happens on the left side. And now I just realized this might be small for you, and I don't know if I can zoom in. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's well, okay, no, too big. Yeah, a little bit better. Can everybody see? Oh, crap. Come in, come in. All right. Now, can everybody see? Yes. Ah, good. Finally, some enthusiasm. <gasps> All right. I'm going to zoom in here, and I'm going to zoom in here. And it, oh, he did that. Oh. Sorry, not used to Windows 10 yet. OK, now I want. <laughs> Right, this should be enough. All right. So first of all, what we're going to do is on the bottom left side in red, what you have is the server side. And on the green, you have the client side. We're going to be starting with the server because we do want to serve some connection. So we start by importing the library socket that gives us access to the low-level inter uh, interface for sockets that comes with Python. Oh, and that is ugly, finally. Uh, can you? Mm, you know what? Let me start again. All right. Starting again. So we're going to import the library socket that gives us access to the low-level interface. And then we're going to be looking at the first primitive of socket, which is socket. This here is a primitive that is pretty basic. When you want to create a file handler, you do have to call open. So with socket, it's kind of the equivalent, but for network communication path. The parameters that are now optional in Python 3.6, because they assume TCP, are what type of uh, net layer 3 protocol communication do you want? That's here representing IP. They have weird name. Don't worry. They are all referenced. And here, reference to TCP as a protocol for streaming information. Uh, and you can have other protocols of stream, like SCTP or uh, um, I don't know all those protocols. But that's where you would normally specify what, what type of socket you want, which <coughs> protocol you want to use for doing transport. Well, I think you can also have a Unix solution. You can have a Unix socket. Sorry? Yes, you can have Unix socket. You can have uh, something else than IP, uh, Bluetooth, I think. Yes, Bluetooth is an AF as well. You can put any kind of socket in there that are not something local to the, um, uh, the file system. All right, sorry, I got lost in my mind. Uh, so we're going to spin the socket. Wait, why is there two already? Is this running? No. My bad. Why is there two sockets? <coughs> yeah, but I, I got here two different uh, process being started by Sigwin. Yeah, but the red, the green is not started yet, so it's not there. Should not be. Oh, nice! A bug in a presentation. That's gonna be nice. Ah, crap. What do I do? Because this is now sad. You're supposed to see only one right now. I want to see it disappear. Oh, it must be a. Yeah. 
the debugger is inside the uh, process as well. I did that presentation four times, and I never had that problem. Now I got it. So probably something with, uh, on my side to look at later. Anyway, sorry for the delay. So the server side here, we have an, uh, no, it did something again. Oh, anyway, sorry guys, I'm gonna start. Anyway, so we created this socket, and it's this one here. This socket uh, is now a file descriptor in our process, but that's pretty much it about it. There's not much other information that I'm forgetting. Now the next primitive we're gonna be looking at is bind. Bind is basically telling the OS Hey, I want to reserve those resources explicitly. Can you give them to me? So in this case, I'm going to reserve port 15,000. Notice that there's nothing appearing for the connection yet. And uh, at that point, the OS inside of it knows that port 15,000 is reserved. So nobody else can already use that port, even though nothing tells us about it. Now, the next primitive we're going to be looking at is the, an important one that people often misunderstand. Uh, listen tells the OS that it should accept connection on your behalf. And this is really important to understand because connections are going to be accepted, whether you want it or not, by the OS. And the number you pass it in here is the number of connections you're ready to accept in parallel. All right, and now what do we see? We do see that our socket is now on listen. We see the, the uh, file descriptor for it that uh, Netstat is reading and telling us. Now, I could go to the client side and show how connect work, but let's continue here. We got an accept call, which is the next primitive on the server side to accept and receive a new connection from the queue that listen has. What it's actually going to do in the background is going to give us a file descriptor and the information of the address of the client that connected to us. So there's also another thing to know about accept. It is a blocking call. In that sense, if I have no connection coming in, my program will wait in for one to come in. Now, I'm going to go on the client side because we do want a connection now. And what we do is we have, uh, we import socket, we spin our own socket as a TCP as well, and then we have the connect primitive. And the connect primitive is pretty much for bind, the same as bind, but it actually goes uh, on the remote endpoints being specified. So bind is the local point, connect is the remote point. And rem rem remember this because it's gonna be important. All right, so now I connected. We see that the prompt came back here. And uh, now we're going to be exploring the receive and send command. At this point, the connection is established on both sides. We can see two more file descriptors here. Hmm. One for the server side and one for the client side. If we look at the, um, at the file descriptor themselves, we see this one is the connection that we just established, while this one is the client cluster the client connection file descriptor. They all live inside their own PID. And I really wonder why the four is there. I'm keeping, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a question here that some, maybe some of you uh, master guru knows what this is. The number in there. I've been curious, I've been bitten by it, and I wondered what it was. Does every, anybody has an ID here? It's actually uh, more uh, closer to what a file is than anything else. While a file has an inode, sockets also, that is the inode number. And as I am in a SIGWIN uh, interface, so a simile network, a simile kernel, the number you're seeing here is since the beginning of my kernel's been up, this is the inode I have in my kernel. All right. So that does the point of the connection and how it works. Now, we can receive data on it. Mm, receive is a blocking call, though. And the number you're, you have to pass into receive. 
What's that number? Yes, the number of bytes, but will I receive 4,000 bytes? It's a what? It's the uh, up to, exactly. It's the number of bytes the OS is allowed to return to you. So basically, if you, go, you receive a packet of 10,000 bytes, well, you're just going to receive the 4,000 first. If you receive a packet of one byte, well, you're just going to receive one byte. So this is what the number is here, is give me up to this number of bytes. You try to play with this number for getting high throughput on network connections and application. That is their goal here. And it's a blocking call as well. Uh, so on the other side, we have the send primitive in which we, we tell it what we want to send. And then finally, we send the message. We see that it's being printed out it here. So we got the send and receive being connected from one way and to the other. Did I surprise anybody with that? Yeah. All right. I'm going to close the listening file descriptor. So what happened now? I closed my listening file descriptor, but the, only, the other twos are still active. Do you think they still work? Not what? Oh, yeah. And we could. Let's see. Could I do this? No, oh, it seems to have passed. <laughs> and uh, control C, that's not what I want. It still works, even though the listening file descriptor is not there. Is this useful to know? <laughs> kind of. That's how Nginx, Apache, and other program do to reload their configuration without going down and closing your client connection. They just close the listening file descriptor, and they open a new one with a new configuration. Nobody saw it, nobody knows, and it still goes on as if nothing happened. Um, so that's about it. Uh, and now we're going to close the connection. Well, sorry, the primitive close, but I'm guessing you all understand what this would do, right? Sorry, I assumed. All right. So this does a turn on how the primitive works. So this is what we've just seen. The socket is creating the new communication endpoint, the local communication endpoint. Bind does the reservation of the local address. Listen, announce to the OS that you're ready to accept connection. And uh, accept actually returns any new connection to your program so that you can interact with your client. And connect does the remote connection. Finally, the send and receivers is sending and receiving data on the, on the uh, file descriptors that are there. And close, release the connection. That's does the turn of all of what socket should be. Any surprise, any question at that point? All right, so the first trick that I've learned while doing a network library client, uh, I had to do my own mockup of a server uh, in a telecom binary network, so I had to learn how to utilize Socket. And one of the things I would have loved to know about is the fact that before doing a connect, you do a listen. That's like creating a, a, di a directory for a file. When you do connect, you do connect before accept, because that's like opening a file for writing versus opening a file for reading. And send and receive, send before receive, because otherwise you're going to be waiting a long time for your data that will never come. So this is a basic trick. What it ends up looking like is like this. You spin the server socket. You bind to your local address. You start the listening. And then with the client, sorry, I'm going to have to skip here. With the client, you connect to your remote en endpoint. And at that point, you can do the accept, which is the uh, equivalent of reading the f a new file. And then you will have your new file. All right, uh, send before receive. So this is the first trick I wish I knew. The next one is a little bit more important, and I think it's not known enough. Um, who here do GUnit uh, kind of test cases? The GUnit format test cases. Uh, unit tests is uh, based on GUnit, for example. Yeah, the setup and teardown thing, uh, where you can have a setup here being done, 
and then you have the teardown that will do the cleanup, and then you just specify the tests you want to do with those setups. Yes? What exactly are you thinking? Sorry? What are you thinking? Like, what application? Uh, as of now, it has no relevance. Can I tell, tell you later? <laughs> I'm really sorry. It's not that I don't think your question is important. It's that I'm limited on time. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Uh, yes, port zero, sorry. If I'm using that format, though, I may want to be able to execute my test case in parallel. But if I use this uh, bind with a specific port, what will happen? Well, my port will be reserved, and my ne next parallel test case won't be able to execute. What's the solution? Well, you could go and implement your own port incrementer that's going to do the bind uh, for you, and it's going to increment from the port uh, range of port. Is that a good solution or a bad solution? Bad solution. <laughs> it's an ugly solution. Don't never do that, please. I've seen this, and I did this, and saw this too many times. One of the things that you might not have known is that the socket API does expose a port that is called the port zero. This port is a special port. It tells the OS, give me a free available port that I can use to do my, sh my things. <laughs> and uh, at that point, the OS goes inside of himself, look at what resource he has available, and gives you one. Um, oh, yeah. So at that point, after that, whenever you're having a, a library, a client mock like Redis, Mongo, or whatever, and you're having a mock for that service, pass it port zero. It will accept it. And then you can go with your client and fetch the actual port the OS return it to you. This really works. It works really well. It keeps the flexibility for you uh, later, down the, this, uh, later down the road where you want to do parallel testing, and it will speed up by a good factor your test cases. By the way, TCP is a protocol that has a source port or a destination port. But we only did connect on the client. The DOS, the, the, do you have, my, okay, I'm going to tell the answer right away. I failed on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so connect inside of it has an implicit bind. The implicit bind is on address 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Port zero, which tells the OS, give me all the interfaces, a free available port, and I'm going to do my request later on. And this is really important to know because there are source port exhaustions that are possible to happen. All right. And finally, my last trick. This is my last slide. Can I get five more minutes? Yes. All right. Who here has been dealing with Docker containers? All right who here has been dealing with Docker's container stripped down. Like, no Python, no Perl, only Bash. Oh, a few. <laughs> I thought Bell were the only one. <laughs> All right. Let's go here. All right. With all of what we've learned tonight, and only a Bash shell, I will magically go and do a remote connection without any telnet or any other program. I'm going to first execute on a file handler that I'm going to define by myself. In this, this scenario, I'm going to define the number five. Zero is standard in, one is standard out, two is standard error. Five should be a good number. I'm going to redirect all the input of that file script, that file handler, I should call it, to a specific file, the input and the output. And that file will be on a specific <coughs> path, path sorry, uh, that Bash is aware of. And I'm meaning Bash here because it doesn't work with the old shell that is 20 years old. And that's sometimes what you find in containers, but at least this would work. At this point, what I've given uh, bash is, I want to do a TCP connection. I didn't tell it which host. 
I think this one will be evident. And which port I want it to do. Do you think this is going to work? I've <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I won't type SSL as fast as that. <laughs> so yeah, I did a connection to Google at that point. If I wasn't able to resolve Google, then I would have had an error on execution. For example, that should not exist. All right. So we can see that the DNS resolution did not work. It didn't know what that service was. Surprisingly enough. So if you ever find yourself having no way of testing your connectivity inside a container, this is a nice trick to know up your sleeve. You're going to be seen as the wizard who understands how sockets work, and it will help you resolve operational issue where your gray log doesn't connect to an Elasticsearch or your log stash. And that completes my presentation. Who here learned something new? All right. Thanks a lot, everybody, to have, uh, have come. <laughs> and I will take questions later. <laughs> three questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Up to three questions uh, if you are. Yes. If you do put anything in English to me. Sorry? Yeah, he can type faster than he can do it. I'm putting. On Google? Yeah. Yeah, I could. It did not return anything to me. Oh, yeah, I need to do a get. Okay, okay. Yeah, you need to get. Get slash. Wait, don't you need to do it? Is it for HTTP 1.0? All right, so I did it. The question was, can you do port 80 and get your response from Google? Yes, I can. <coughs> so Next question. The second question. Go on. <laughs> yes. Oh god, I'm a beginner at this. Uh, I normally program in Python. The question is, can you do a listening file descriptor in Bash? I think you can, I just don't know how. I'm sorry, I'm really a beginner at this. <laughs> I would never recommend anyone do it. <laughs> Me neither, but I've seen things way too weird to something. All right, last question. Yes? Yeah, what is the obligation? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm like a really beginner. <laughs> no problem. Uh, did you miss the beginning of the talk? Though? Yeah. Okay, I can, can come and see me after. We're going to go back okay. through if you want. Yeah, thanks. All right. So um, I'm still going to answer your question. What is the application for which I did this? I had to work in a telecom world with uh, Bell Mobility where a lot of protocols are old, binary, and you have to kind of buy a library from somewhere else that costs a lot. While it's super easy to understand if you just read the specification and know how socket works. I've avoided a lot of uh, stupid contract for Bell by just proving that this doesn't make sense and I can do it by myself here. And then you save a lot of money to your own company because you understand how things work in the back end, background. So this is the application in which I've used most of those, and I've developed a test solution based on the circuit as well. Okay. Why are you using a router to go A router? Yeah, like to configure the ports. Which port? I don't get your question, sorry. Yeah, I mean, because you, aren't you trying to open ports, read them up? Sorry, I do uh, say uh -huh. It was just for the sake of the example, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's just an example. That's not the. Uh, it's not like it's not like actual production ready code, I believe. <laughs> well, if you just want to send and receive, yes. <laughs> anyway, thank you.